Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Rachel. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on our Tuesday Talks. You're welcome. It's going to be such an interesting chat today. I'm going to talk a little bit about sex. So we uh, kind of urge our viewers and listeners to maybe comment down below. Then we can maybe give the questions to you later. If yeah, there's, absolutely. Uh, anything of interest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you are a psychosexual and relationship therapist, mm -hmm. specializing in working with clients who fall into the category of gender, sexuality, or relationship diverse. Yes. With the uh, acronym GSRD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also LG. BTQ. BTQ plus yeah. community. <laughs> so there's a lot to cover today. Yep. Yeah. All right. We're very interested to hear from you. Um, so first of all, just kind of tell us how you got into it. Tell us a little bit about, yeah, just the evolution of you becoming uh, such a specialized therapist. Yeah. So um, I have always been interested in um, talking about sex um, ever since I was like very young. I've always kind of been very open talking about sex with my friends and things like that. Um, and so I felt quite natural when a job came up a few years ago at a sex toy company and I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. That sounds right <laughs> up my street. I can then tell everyone that I work at a sex toy company and that will like spark off these conversations. Um, so I worked there for a couple of years. In that time, I was then like, I really enjoy this. I want to learn more about it. I did a master's in gender and sexuality. And then from that, I was like, I'm enjoying this even more. I want to <laughs> do it full time. I want to do it as a career. I want to talk about it more. And I've seen firsthand how talking openly about sex and sexual pleasure can help people really have much better a more enjoyable and more fulfilling sex and relationships. And so then I trained as a sex and relationship therapist and here I am. Amazing. <laughs> On Tuesday Talks. <laughs> so just going back a few steps. Mm -hmm. So you said you were always interested in talking about sex. Mm -hmm. So when did this always start? How young is young? I mean, like... I want to say ever since I can remember, but that's obviously yeah. like not true. It's not like I was, so was five years old. Yeah, or I would say so. That? Ever since, like, I would say I was in my group of friends, like more of a late developer. So like 15, I think I had sex, but I had friends who were having sex at like 13, which is very young. Um, but so ever since sex was kind of like a spoken about topic at school, in our friendship group, things like that, that has kind of been from when? I've been interested in it, I would say. So like, like an early teenager. And have you had experience before then? Or was this just like something that was interesting to you? I think it was just interesting. Like I didn't even have my first kiss until I was like 14, I think. Right. Like, which is a very normal age. Like if anything, it's still on the young side. I just yeah. want to put that out there for everyone who's worrying <laughs> that they're a late developer if they haven't had a kiss at 14. Um, it is very young, yeah. Yeah, but like I think... Yeah, it was just, it's just always fascinated me. So it makes sense that I'm here now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just going to touch on something that we chatted about earlier mm -hmm. because you were saying you were in a friends group and that friends group was kind of interested in sex and you guys were um, maybe a little bit different to all your all the other kids in your class or school. Mm -hmm. um, so were you ever kind of labeled as anything? I don't know, maybe promiscuous or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Or did it just kind of fly by? No. So, yeah, when I was at school, like I was saying to you earlier, like I was never one of the popular kids or anything like that. Um, and so inevitably there's sort of a pecking order at school mm. and we ended up getting picked on by the kind of popular kids. Um, and they kind of labeled all of us as like the dirty sex group. Which, wow, that's harsh. <laughs> yeah, which is just like a wild thing to accuse Good teenagers point, yeah. of, especially because like half of us at that point, including me, had not had any sexual experience at all. Um, and so I think that label of like promiscuous has followed me from a very young age. Um, but now it's something that I embrace along with like a lot of my friends and we really enjoy that. Nice. Okay. So what falls under GSRD? Mm -hmm. What do you deal with specifically? So um, I, like you said earlier, so 
gender diversity, sexuality diversity, relationship diversity. Um, so just anything that sits outside of what you would typically consider to be like the norm, um, which is such a broad thing that I will yeah, break so it down a little bit. That? What would you yeah. consider the norm? So, um, so like gender diversity is anyone who is like trans, intersex, agender, gender queer, like anyone who's not what is commonly referred to as like a cis man or a cis woman. Right. So like anyone who isn't that would be like gender diverse, sexuality diverse is like like you said, LGBTQ or like queer, um, anyone who's interested in pursuing relationships with people who aren't of the opposite gender right. um, or like that exclusively. And then relationship diversity covers things like kink and non-monogamy. Um, so people who engage in sex practices that are seen as outside of like the norm and um, non-monogamy as in people who engage in multiple romantic relationships at the same time with everyone's consent and participation so not cheating that okay, is yeah, that is not consent. covered yeah. consent under the umbrella of you can't kind of squeeze that in yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so what percentage of the population would you say is kind of non you know traditional let's say or what we like think fits of... into one of those yeah. categories yeah i mean i really think it's much bigger then people admit right? yeah, yeah absolutely especially because like those are like three quite large right. categories there like anyone who is like not straight fits into that anyone who is trans fits into that anyone who engages in kink which is like a large proportion of people whether they are aware that what the kind of sex yeah, they're having know, could be considered yeah, kink or not that, yeah um and non-monogamy is also like a growing I don't want to say trend because it's not a trend. It's been around for thousands of years, yeah. but awareness of it is growing. And I do think along with that comes more people trying it out. So I think the statistics keep rising as well. Like more young people are identifying as queer than ever before. I think the most recent statistic is something around like a third, between like wow. a fifth and a third of okay. all kids. They feel like they sit somewhere in like the the queer umbrella. Um non-monogamy there's a study in america that said like one in five people has engaged in non-monogamy at some point in their life okay. so it's really like once yeah, you add it all up low. it's yeah, probably yeah, yeah. like <laughs> over half of people are some form of gsrd so it's really like it's quite hush, it's, hush i think yeah. yeah i think a lot like like in general why i wanted to get into sex therapy was talking more openly about sex and i think these are like the more hush hush yeah. things within what is already quite a hush hush topic. So I think it's really important to talk openly about it. Okay. That's what we're here to do today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go slowly through a few of the things specifically that you do. So what is kink? Okay. So kink is one of those things that's like quite difficult to explain. Okay. Um, but um a good definition that I like is that it is um any Anything that you do for sexual enjoyment that would be considered non-enjoyable in a non-sexual context. I've really butchered that, but... <laughs> okay, I think we're going to imagine. <laughs> That's okay. Did that make sense? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Tell me if it made sense. <laughs> Maybe you can walk us through it. Um... Uh, like a case study or like uh, okay yeah, yeah. So a good a good like I'm trying an to example be, I'm trying to be too broad there yeah, like I'm okay. trying to encapsulate Let's narrow all it down of to kink. an example so yeah. I think the most when people think of kink they most often think of like BDSM which stands for like bondage domination sadism masochism like right. it's kind of a like you think of like restraints you think of whips and chains you think of being in like a dungeon and someone wearing like a hood or a face mask or something like that like you think of that quite like aggressive power dynamic kind of sex and that is obviously a big part of kink and what a lot of people think when they think of kink but it's not just that like a foot fetish can be considered okay. a kink like if you're into if you're into feet if you're into Oh my god like almost anything like you could be really into cars like literally anything can be a kink if you get off on it 
and it's not something that like a normal person so would consider it's a missionary to be missionary or king. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. All right, I think we get the idea. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um walk us through um what are the boundaries of what happens in a polyamorous relationship? As in what what makes a relationship polyamorous? Yeah. Okay, so in general, it would be all all parties consent to it. Like everyone needs to be aware that the relationship is polyamorous. Mm-hmm. Um and so what I love about polyamory and non-monogamy um i kind of use those terms interchangeably okay. although like non-monogamy is an umbrella and yeah. polyamory sits underneath okay. it um but what i love about it is that it just allows you to like create your own relationship right. like when when we think of monogamy generally we think of like a very specific kind of monogamy which is like you you date some people you find a person you like and then you date each other for a little while and then you become exclusive and then you become boyfriend girlfriend and then you move in together (laughs) and then you move in together and then you get married and then like you have 2.4 children and then you live together happily ever after and then you die like that is so that's like the relationship make it sound so (laughs) So wonderful (laughs) but like there's a very there's like a very traditional view yeah like a blueprint of yeah there's a blueprint of what you must do and there's a blueprint of like what the norm is and like your partner like you should feel fully like fulfilled by your partner in every way and they should be everything for you and you should still want sex with them and desire them after like 30 years together to the extent that you did when you first got together and ultimately that framework doesn't work for anyone like monogamous or non-monogamous and i think the lovely thing about non-monogamy and something that everyone can learn from whether you're monogamous or non-monogamous is like sitting down and thinking like what works for me what works for my partner what works for us in our relationship let's design our own relationship whether that means we want to sleep with other people and be non-monogamous or we don't want to sleep with other people and be monogamous let's look at what we want and what we don't want and go from there Mm -hmm. and so i think that's a really nice framework that i learned from non-monogamy interesting is it difficult to start that conversation with your partner i think it can be i think a lot of people see a conversation about opening up a relationship as a threat yeah um like especially if you've been in a monogamous relationship you've been in it for a while and then your partner comes to you and they say I'm thinking about sleeping with other people. Yeah. Like that is going to feel for sure quite threatening and scary. And a lot of feelings are most likely going to come up from that around like, am I enough? Yeah. Am I not good enough? Like, what is it about me? Or like my partner's going to leave me? Like they, it's just like a step. They sure. just they just yeah. want like an overlap before they pick the next person. Um so I think it's very natural for those kind of feelings to come up, but I think it's absolutely a conversation that can be navigated how do you deal with jealousy in relationships like that i mean it definitely comes up more than in monogamous relationships generally um but i don't think it's like jealousy isn't an emotion that's exclusive to non-monogamy but it is but yeah it's certainly heightened like you're really you're creating an environment where everything is kind of heightened like more feelings are going to come out from it does it come up more frequently can people deal with it or is that kind of do they then end up i don't know trust i guess is an issue because now like maybe your partner hasn't called you back in the five minutes that you expect him to Mm -hmm. and you're like what is happening (laughs) right so i think i don't know maybe there's a setting for paranoia there because maybe you you went along with it but maybe you don't 100 percent want to go along with it Mm -hmm. or i don't know maybe everything everyone's fine and it just rolls how it rolls i mean i think like you've described just all of the gamut of options (laughs) like and really it can be any of those like for some people they like some people just don't get jealous which i personally find wild like i'm they they some people just like oh yeah i don't i don't care what my partner yeah but i don't care i think that's the key right Mm, yeah if you care i think yeah they potentially but like for some people it's really not an issue for some people it is a huge issue and like it really deeply affects them um i think one thing that i always try and like I have a lot of clients who come to me wanting to work on jealousy within like non-monogamous relationships um and one thing that 
I always like offer to people is like jealousy is not a primary emotion. Right. Like there's always something else behind it. Like what are you what are you jealous of? Like what is that? What's the feeling underneath it? And like unpacking that because often it's like feeling like you're not good enough or you're feeling like compared or you're feeling like there's a lack within your own relationship right. like if your if your cup is full you're not going to look over at someone else who also has a full cup yeah. and be jealous of them it's when you feel like there's a lack within your own relationship dynamic or within yourself that jealousy often tends to come up so that's kind of okay. the work that we often do what is queer? Okay, so queer is, I mean, I use it kind of interchangeably with like LGBTQIA+, plus, um, because one, it rolls off the tongue a little easier. <laughs> um, but two, so it's it's an umbrella term um, for anyone within the like LGBTQIA+, plus right. community, and like the Q of LGBTQIA+, <laughs> is queer. Okay. Um, but it, it encapsulates... Anyone whose relationship, um, anyone whose sexuality um, kind of sits outside of straight or like heterosexual. Um, so it historically was used as a slur um, and now a lot of people are kind of reclaiming it within the community. So that's partly why I like to use the term queer when like describing my own sexuality and when talking about queerness generally. Um it's also like a rejection of the norm, like the same way that I talked earlier about um, like learning from non-monogamy yeah. when picking what your relation, what works for you and what doesn't work for you. I think queerness captures the same essence of like rejecting what society like tells you right. is the norm and like allows you to like pick, pick what fits you. Yeah. Okay. You also treat... Sex workers. Yeah, I work with... quite interesting. I work with sex workers, yeah. <laughs> Male and female? Are yeah, they I'm... both or...? Well, everyone, yeah. Like, I... Okay. I don't discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of issues do they come to you with? I mean, on like, kind of the same issues that anyone would come with. Like, sex work is work the same way that any other work is work. We're all, in some ways, selling our bodies, whether we're doing, like, manual labour <laughs> yeah. or, you know, having sex with someone for money, like... To me, it really doesn't make a difference. Like the vast majority of people who do sex work who come to me are coming because they have an issue around like stigmatization that mm. comes alongside doing sex work rather than the work itself. Like sometimes it's around, I don't know, like an assault that happened or something right. like that. But for the most part, it's the the stigma alongside that or not feeling comfortable being able to be out to your friends or family or loved ones okay so we're talking about sexually diverse mm -hmm. people and situations does it differ across countries or cultures yes um it does okay <laughs> um and why i mean i think <laughs> um i like i can only answer from my own perspective in that I primarily see clients who are based in the UK mm -hmm. obviously the UK is a relatively diverse yeah. country like I don't just see people who look like me for example yeah. um but I mean I think part of the reason why there is a diversity within what gender and sexuality and relationship diversity looks like across the globe is because it's massive, but also, <laughs> because like, I mean, part of the reason why it's similar in a lot of Western countries is because of colonization. Right. Um, and part of the reason why it's different in countries that haven't experienced that in the same way is because there is just more diversity within those kind of cultures. Okay, cool. Um, let's just touch upon gender diverse as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's kind of becoming more and more mainstream and in the media. What does that mean exactly? Um, so that would mean anyone who sits within like the the trans umbrella of like not not conforming to like I I was assigned female at birth and I identify as a woman and my gender identity like correlates with my sexual 
like my sex organs essentially um so anything outside of that and that can also include like intersex people um who are born with they well there's lots of different ways in which you can be intersex but do you want to tell us a few (laughs) (laughs) so like if you if you have like androgen insensitivity disorder i think it's called um or androgen insensitivity syndrome um that's when you are (laughs) when um your like your chromosomes yeah yeah thank you (laughs) when your chromosomes are like male Mm -hmm. which is x x y Y, thank you (laughs) you're really (laughs) pushing my like science knowledge to its limits here so you are like in the womb you are developing as like a boy like you have testes um however your body is naturally immune to testosterone and so you then you're not responding to those sex right, hormones okay. in the womb telling you, like, grow a penis, like, put the testes yeah. in the scrotum. <laughs> okay. Like, all of those things. Like, your your body's not responding in that way. And so, whilst you have testes, you develop and present, for the most part, in the world as a woman. Female. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that all the embryos actually start off as female. Exactly. It's and that's only... why men have nipples. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is a fun fact. And also, it's really interesting when you look at, like, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, like, diagrams. Like a of... cross-section of a human? Are you... The... No? <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> Maybe we're going to go. <laughs> yeah, because it's literally the same. It's just inverted. <laughs> I was kidding. Okay, go. <laughs> right, this is not going to be so straightforward to cut and paste. <laughs> All right, good. No, do you know why? There was a there was an exhibition called Human years ago, mm. right? Which was actually very controversial. So was it the one at the O2? Uh maybe it was massive. Maybe mm. when when the bodies were actually sliced. Oh wow. Um actually some okay, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about the details. But actually, um it was just naked bodies sliced in different directions and mm. cross sections. And you can actually see that the female organs are just basically projected downwards. Yeah, exactly. It's okay, so we were going to yeah, say yeah, the same yeah, thing. That's right. Yeah, so if you look at like a diagram of um, like what a penis looks like versus like a clitoris, yeah. and especially if you look at like the internal structure of it, which like we've only been able to look at the internal structure of a clitoris since 1998 when it yeah. was discovered um, or like researched properly. Um, but they are basically the same thing, like the same structure. Yeah. And so it's really interesting kind of looking at that. Yeah, I agree. So I did a little office poll <laughs> when I said I was going to be talking to you. Everyone became very interested all of a sudden. <laughs> so I have some questions from my um, office mates. <laughs> so one, why is kink so enjoyable? Um, good question. I mean, I think one, it's not enjoyable for everyone. There okay. are like there are gonna be people out there who are just not into it, and that is totally fine. Um, I think for a lot of people, there is a degree of like power control mm-hmm. is very nice. Um, I can't remember who says it, but there's a quote I really like, which is like everything in life is about sex, apart from sex, which is about power. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, interesting. And I don't think that, like, stands true all the time, but mm. I do think it applies very nicely to kink and why I think a lot of people enjoy kink. Um, I also think, like, bodies are amazing and there's so many different ways that things, sensations can be mm. enjoyable. And, like, if you just let yourself experiment, like, you're bound to come up with some new way that you enjoy being touched. And I think kink is kind of part of that. And I also think kink can be very fun and playful. And like, ultimately, I think sex should be fun and playful and yeah. enjoyable. And it just kind of really like brings that front and center. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the most common issues that people come to you with? Around kink or just, uh, just in general? In general. So I would say a lot of people come to me um wanting to open up their relationship and wanting help navigating that a lot of people come to me with jealousy that they're experiencing as a result of non-monogamy some people come to me with um like shame they have around certain kinks um and wanting to kind of work on that internalized shame that they have um those are probably the main ones like a lot of people come like a lot of people come to me and they are like 
in a queer relationship or they are non-monogamous, but the issues that they're coming with are also just issues that you would see in any relationship. Mm -hmm. So like communication, like we want to be able to communicate better or we want help navigating this big scary thing that's happening in our life. Like, do we have children? Do we not have children? Like all of those kind of things. Like ultimately, whatever kind of sex you're into or who you want to have sex with, like we're all people and we all experience yeah. like a lot of the same feelings and emotions yeah true that's why i kind of did the show because like to show that no one is alone everyone's exactly. gone through something everyone's kind of doing similar things mm -hmm. so no one is an island um i used to work for this company back in the day and so we're going to talk about orgasms now okay okay <laughs> change the topic a little bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we were playing truth and dare mm -hmm. and someone asked um there were probably about 10 of us maybe 50 50 girls boys mm -hmm. or men women um, and someone asked who's ever faked an orgasm mm -hmm. and most of the hands shot up, including the men. Mm -hmm. So should we be faking orgasms? <laughs> and why do people do it? I guess it's kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Like I ideally in an ideal world, I don't think anyone should be faking orgasms. Like I think we should be having sex with people where it feels safe enough and enjoyable enough and like bringing enough of that like playfulness in that I spoke about earlier of like, I had a really nice time. I didn't have an orgasm, but that's okay. And that person will be able to hear that and be like, cool, I did have an orgasm and I'm sorry that you didn't, maybe next time, that kind of thing. Like I think in an ideal world, it would be a conversation. How many times like, is this next time? <laughs> How many times well, is it yeah. acceptable before you're like, actually, maybe there's an issue? Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, ideally, no, we shouldn't be faking orgasms. Yeah, correct, we correct. shouldn't need to. Um, and it's actually probably not good for the partner as well because they're learning things that are just not... Well, yeah, you're not you're like stimulating. Ultimately, ultimately, you're doing a disservice to yeah. yourself and your yeah, partner. Exactly. Like you're not yeah. giving them, like, sure, in that moment, you're giving them like, well done, you did it, you made me have an orgasm. But in the long term, you're teaching them you're teaching them bad habits yeah, around correct. like, yeah. this is how I like to be touched when that isn't necessarily the case. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about the female orgasm. Now yeah. that we know that even men <laughs> like fake men stop faking. Yeah. And ladies too. <laughs> Everyone stop faking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so the female orgasm. Mm -hmm. Uh so what percentage of women in general orgasm or don't orgasm? Is there a statistic around that? In general? Yeah. Um so this is actually some research that um the sex toy company that I worked for mm -hmm. did whilst I was working with them um around how many people in like different gendered relationships mm -hmm. consistently achieve orgasm. So if if you're a woman who likes to sleep with men, the statistics are pretty dire. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the exact numbers now, but it was something like in in a relationship where like you're a woman and you're in a relationship with another woman, consistently you will achieve orgasm around like 90, 95% of the time. Okay. Um, if you're a woman who, like a straight woman who sleeps with men, you the the numbers more like 40, 45%. Wow. Do you think it's because girls communicate better? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think probably, yeah. I think the way in which we, like, men are brought up to think about sex and what sex means for people, um, like, masculinity and, like, the patriarchy, mm. like, none of those things do any of us any favours yeah. at all. But I also think it it means that, like, yeah, women are often left behind when it comes to the orgasm gap is what it's right. called, like oh, yeah. closing the orgasm gap. Okay. So is there anything that men should know about the female orgasm that they clearly don't? And maybe should women know that about themselves? I mean, I think the best advice that I can give is that like, there's like, I'm never going to be able to sit here and be like, oh yeah, just touch yourself in this one specific yeah. way and you'll achieve an orgasm. Like the best advice I can give is like, know your body, get to know your body, get to know what you like, what you don't like, how you like to be touched. And then have sex with someone who you feel comfortable being able to communicate that with and who listens to you yeah. and then go from there like trial and error so it's, it's not... you yourself first before yeah. like okay. if you if you can't make yourself orgasm mm. how can you expect someone else to do that 
Like that is just shocking to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you have to love yourself first before you, you know, yeah. other people can love you. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Why is talking about sex still such a taboo, or orgasms, or things like? Okay, if we talk about reproduction, this is the only way that humans can reproduce, right? Mm -hmm. um, so why is it still such a taboo topic? You know, why why do we need to read about it or go to someone specifically, a, a specific therapist to find out anything about it? Mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot of shame around sex. Um, and specifically, like you said, like sex for reproduction, fine. <laughs> like sex for enjoyment, sex for pleasure is... Like there's far more of a taboo there. And I think it's that that like unashamed like pleasure and enjoyment that I think there's a lot of shame around. And I think this is me like positing. I don't know this for sure, but I think in large part that comes from like Christianity and like say, religion and things bad, like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Like I do think there's like Catholicism. Like a lot of people have like a Catholicism kink because then it's kind of like oh, reclaiming that. Um <laughs> but yeah, like that that shame is just like an inherent part of that. Like you're born into this world and that's immediately sinful. Like you have to apologize for everything you do. Like, yeah, I just think that probably plays a large part in why sex is still kind of seen as shameful and taboo. Okay. So let's say I come to you for the first time for therapy and whatever. Um, what does that look like? So what we would do they like, it's ultimately it's pretty similar to like if you've ever had therapy with any other therapist like the first session is an assessment session we would sit down I would kind of take your history I would ask you lots of questions I would ask what you want out of therapy like what do you want like what is your goal and then I kind of always go from there and then just asking lots of questions trying to get like as full a picture of as possible of like you as a person you as like a sexual individual like any medical history especially if like I don't think this would be why you were coming but like if you had erectile dysfunction I would be asking you about what medication you're taking mm. um like how long that's been an issue that sort of thing like getting really in there and asking questions that some people find well they are personal questions mm. but like some people feel quite uncomfortable answering them but I always try and create an environment where people feel as safe as possible <laughs> oh, answering do do those that? questions <laughs> yeah. I don't know just no, by being okay. myself <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't always work yeah. but like ultimately I try and like people choose to come to me sure. like I work in private practice people are seeking me out I always do an initial call with people I ask them to speak to multiple therapists and then if they want to work with me mm. they come come to me and so it seems to work so far that like by that point if someone has chosen to come to me they feel right. comfortable enough opening up about it does it take a long time for people to actually open up as to what the issue is I think a lot of people yeah like they come with an issue and then you've done like six eight sessions with them and then there's just this like big reveal and they're like oh by the way there's this whole other thing yeah. and and then I'm like okay that's that's actually what yeah, we're working yeah. on here and um it's like a well-known thing in like therapy generally there's this thing called door door handling mm -hmm. which is when you've got like five minutes left in your session and the client's just been like chatting about whatever the whole time and you haven't really gotten into anything and then with like five minutes left to go they're like okay so this really big thing <laughs> happened yeah, yeah. And you're like why have you done this everyone works better under pressure <laughs> <laughs> okay um, is there anything that I haven't asked you and you think it's something that is really interesting or popular or that you're coming across that would be interesting for our viewers and listeners? Oh, we're going to be here for <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so. I mean, I think, yeah. I, I like the Christianity kink. That's funny. <laughs> I would have never even thought of that. <laughs> Honestly, like... Yeah, there is a kink for absolutely everything. I right. can guarantee you that. And, like, that is kind of what I love about, mm. like, humans are just weird little freaks. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> no? Like, Why not just admit that? Right? right? Yeah. Like, and then we can all talk about it. Yeah, and then we can yeah. find the people who are into that weird, freaky yeah, stuff. Yeah, and then yeah. we can do the stuff. Like, it just it just makes sense to me. Okay. <laughs> Um, is there like a positive takeaway that you would like to leave us with? I think know, know yourself, get to know your body, get to know what you like, learn to communicate that 
these are all like big things. Like I'm saying this, like it's easy. Yeah, like all of these yeah, steps yeah. take time. Really think about what serves you in life, like what you want from life, from relationships. Don't don't think about like, oh well, I have to do this. Yeah. Like if you if you have the privilege to be able to like step outside of like what you feel like you should do, step away from the shoulds and into oh, like what you yeah. actually want and then go from there and be open and upfront with people about what you want and be surprised at how that's often reciprocated. Oh, <laughs> I interesting. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm just very lucky. Like I've, I've created a wonderful bunch of like queer, kinky, non-monogamous, sex positive people around me. And okay. this is like the life that we lead. And I sometimes forget that I do live in a very privileged bubble of like sex positivity. And that's not necessarily possible for everyone, but as much as you can, I think everyone would be happier if they could do those things. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being my guest today. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. See you. <laughs>